trading is about knowing the field. Foreseeing the opportunity. Executing at the right moment. Timing is everything. I know Tin scrambled about it last week, but it's very nice to be back and saying hello, Dream Team, and a very warm welcome to another episode of The Good, The Bad, and The Rugby in partnership with City Index, the leading provider of spread betting, CFD, and FX trading. In the words of Ferris Bueller, life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you could miss it. And the game is certainly moving at a pace at this point of the season. We've got trophies being lifted, playoffs looming into view, players coming and going, speculation around coaches growing, summer tours approaching World Cups, on the not-too-distant horizon. And sometimes you do need to just pause, take a breath, and after a run of 100-mile-an-hour shows in studio and overseas, Hask and Tins are having a bit of a mid-season lie-down this week. So we've got the chance for a saucer of milk and a table for two and a catch-up with the ledge. That is Mr. Shane Hawken. How are you? I'm very good. I'm very good. I fill the void of the two boys. And, and you fill it perfectly as well. I can't tell you how much of a sort of, how much more relaxed I feel this week. I sort of want to lie down and go through. I don't think I can live up to them. Several of my deep rooted issues with you, but um, we won't do that instead. We've got a lot to discuss actually, particularly at the moment, because the lines of communication between England and Ireland seem to be pretty lively at the moment. We've obviously got an Englishman in charge of Ireland doing great things. We've got an Irishman putting his hands up <laughs> to take over in England. We'll come on to that in a moment or two. Uh, we've got four teams from England and Ireland in this weekend's Heineken Champions Cup and a whole host of juicy bits in between as well. What's on your to-do list outside of the rugby world at the moment? What's keeping you busy? Oh, it's uh, two little girls. Yeah, They are keeping me well busy at the moment. Uh, one and three, and both are sick. So that's nice. It's been a Welcome good time. to 2022. <laughs> How's Mrs. Hawken coping with that? Um, she's she's managing, you know, yeah. um, stoically. <laughs> you're cashing in pink cars left, right and centre yeah. in order to be able to... Come and have a chat with us. There is a lot going on at the moment. I, j just before we sort of get into some of the headline makers from the Emerald Isle, um, have you enjoyed watching English rugby eat itself over the last couple of weeks or have you not really paid much attention to it? Um, uh, yeah, always. Uh, always happy with a little bit of um, sort of um, court intrigue. Tends to be the way, isn't, isn't that it? it? There's a bit of court intrigue going on at the moment. Yeah. Um, You're just sort of peering over the fence into the neighbour's garden and seeing that I, I, really not gardening it very well. It's funny though because I'm I'm kind of like a big fan of of Eddie Jones and and have been and when uh, he got England playing their best um, at their best, which was around you know, World Cup last time out. Um, you know, I remember we did we did an event just before the World Cup and I picked them for the World Cup. I thought they were playing the best rugby. They had the most variation in their game. They were you know plenty physical as well. So. I could really see what they were doing and it was a different thing than everyone else was doing. And that's kind of feels like Eddie Jones all over. He's always feels as if he's kind of a one step ahead of rugby. He's, you know, a bit of a thinker, doesn't just fall into the zeitgeist. He's one of the kind of the um, thought, um, whatever the term is, you know. You're the, thought, thought leaders. Yeah, the thought thing. leaders. I th it's, where's that gone? It's completely gone. I don't understand what England are trying to do anymore. So it feels as if that they were basing a game plan around players that they didn't have and then they were putting square pegs and round holes. So, um, And it's not really great to have an England in that sort of shape. I think for the Six Nations, it, de it detracts from it a little bit. Um, so they haven't got their act together. And, and now all of a sudden it's like, is he going to get his act together before, before the World Cup? And the, I'm not sure if saying he's finished after the World Cup is going to help things massively either. Yeah. Do you think they can get it back at this point? To get back to You bring to back what? Farrell, you bring back Tuolangi. Yeah, I think, I think Farrell makes a, a big difference. I wouldn't be hanging too much on, on Tuolangi coming back just because he's played so infrequently for England over the last uh, number of years. Watson May? Yeah, I think they, they add something. Farrell is key. Farrell is key. What they decide to do at 10-12 what they do at eight as well. And if you look at the main constituent parts of England in their sort of best play again, the World Cup, it was 10, 12, um, you know, working really well together. He didn't always pick them together, but when they did, um, that second wave defence made things very difficult. I think Farrell working at 12, um, taking a lot of first receiver ball, but those two guys coming in and out, 
um, and a lot of Vinopolo carrying and dropping the ball off, being a threat, getting your gain line because he can, getting it off loads because he can, but also just dropping the ball off to that forward or that back coming around the corner, which mm. Ireland are doing a lot of at the moment. That the interaction between forwards and backs, it, it was very, very seamless. Everybody knew what they were doing. It doesn't seem to be there in the same extent anymore. Yeah, and so I do think Far Far was a massive loss. He could come back and change things quite significantly, but they do look like a team that's you know lacked a bit of almost a bit of confidence. So you know they're not sure what they are. They, I thought they knew exactly what they were doing previously, and now it looks a bit higgledy piggledy. Even stuff like the kicking game from out out uh, wide has changed. Remember, our, um, England came to Ireland when Ireland were favourites in. Um, so the third round oh, and they ate us yeah. they absolutely ate us but physically yes their line speed was faster than everybody else's their ball carrying was more aggressive and then you know they are getting off the gain line and then they were getting off the gain line more and more and more but their kicking game out wide was phenomenal as well they were getting the ball out to wide channels and then kicking in behind making massive yards that's all gone and you've got now the advent of the you know 50 uh, 22 rule like I would have thought Eddie Jones would have been all over that and we would have been seeing a new strategy that nobody else, I thought he would have been well ahead of the game on that. He's not, he's behind it. Which which makes me think, you know, what's happening with him at the moment? Interesting. I thought we were going to feel a little bit better about ourselves at the back of this, but enjoy the chance <laughs> to, it, to get in while you can. But is there, you know, is there a route back? I would think yes, because of good players, the, the number of players which sometimes can be a hindrance as well. Sometimes you yeah. can, um, you know, try too many things because there's just a, a there's a depth there. But the reason why I think England can get it um, back on mostly is because I think Eddie Jones is like proper rugby genius as well, and I think nobody will be spending more time about how to get this back on track. That's for certain, and I think he'll find a way to make England better, and he needs to do it. Um, but I think he will. In the interest of the sort of. English Irish comparison. There are a lot of people saying that England at this point are not too dissimilar from Ireland. What was it, eighteen months ago? Maybe even twelve months ago. And I think you were quite critical of Ireland a year or so ago. It was that it was that final game of the Six Nations where they battered England that sort of saved yeah. morale and Andy Farrell, oh, etc. I think I think maybe not Andy Farrell. I think he would have continued on. But sort of I, the, the, the no, noise but, died but, down. But it probably it probably saved um, uh, my cats. Uh, really? job I, I think so there was a big clamour which I was you know part of saying if if we're not seeing something more in attack then we actually have to shake this up um, and even prior to that the start of the Six Nations we hadn't seen like a, an, an evolution of what the Irish team were doing we had Joe Smith for a, for a number of years and Joe was brilliant for Ireland, probably Ireland's best coach. But by the end, it just wasn't working. Mm. Um, I think the game, what he was trying to do, um, wasn't being wasn't being fully embraced by players. Um, they were, I think, largely they were sort of intimidated by by him or in some way and, and his game plan and and the the detail that he looked into the Did game. You find that afterwards. as a player under him at Leinster? I never found it with him. I couldn't understand it. I thought, I found working with him easy and great and had a massive impact on my um, performance individually and collectively as ours. So I didn't I didn't get it. Right. And when people were saying that he was stunting their creativity, I, I thought the opposite. I would have always thought the way he set up a team, it was uh, the options were there and you better take the right option, certainly, but the right option, the right option could be the more aggressive one. And it could be that you know there could be that more bit more risk to it, and you might need a bit more skill to do it. But he would never denounce you for you know taking the right option, as it were. Yeah. Whereas I think there was definitely a latent pressure that came in that the the in the last year of his uh, reign, people weren't at least the last year people weren't dealing with it. So so it wasn't working. And then I think we've had this movement towards more attack minded rugby anyway. I didn't see Andy Farrell's philosophy in what Ireland were trying to do. I could see Joe Smith's and I could see him as Joe Smith's number two. It's like, oh, actually, this is a continuation. Which, by the way, a year when they when they announced the change, you would have thought, actually, that's not bad. We'll take more of what Joe Smith is doing. But in that last year, everything changed. Yeah. So doing more of what Joe Smith was doing, but probably not quite as well, was no good anymore. Yeah. Um, 
And we didn't see the change until probably midway through the Six Nations last year. And he was coming under like a lot of, and a lot of pressure. So what are you doing? Explain to us what you're trying to do. Because a lot of the conversation was around, you know, guys are going to be super physical, you know, we're going to put the bodies on the line. Kind of stuff that felt a little bit old school. You know, if, if you're, we're going to have to be worried about Ireland not committing properly, players uh, during the Six Nations, then you've got bigger problems to worry about, don't yeah. you? So I, I think Ireland have always been, you know, for as for as many years I can remember now, fully committed, fully physical, you know, willing to to commit to um to commit to Ireland. So set that aside. So what if you're not doing that, what else are you doing? We were over relying on the box kick. Um we were very conservative on the way we were exiting from our tw- own 22. And um also I didn't think our line speed and defense was very good. Now all that changed almost to the to the moment you said there, not last game against England, things changed. You could see actually we're, we're trying something different here. We're trying more ex- more expansive. The interlinking between forwards and backs was came on in that game, and then he brought that through. Had a really good autumn series, and I thought one of Ireland's best games in the Six Nations for a long time against Wales in the opening game. Yeah. Like phenomenal rugby. They could have put 60 on Wales that day. They'd got the edge com- completely right. They would have done it. So all of a sudden you're from the position where I-, I couldn't see what Andy Farrell was trying to do or what his overall philosophy was. You could see, you can see very now, and now I think you can see what his philosophy is. And he is tapping into a group of players that are, are highly skilled in Ireland. They've got a very good pack. Yeah. They've got a very, very skilled pack and he's definitely playing to those strengths. So back to the question, can England find what Ireland found or do you do you see differences in, in the way that England are set up at the moment relative to where Ireland were 18 months ago? It's not quite like with like because Ireland have fewer resources in terms of playing numbers. So, you know... They're, they're, but in some ways their resources are far better because there's much greater control from top to bottom. Well, th- there is a bit of that but, you know, the idea of having depth of squad and having, you know, the, the full premiership to pick from is, is useful. But... To some degree, it's beside the point. It's what we need to see now is what's Eddie's new philosophy for England? Yeah. And what what is that is? What are the key components to it? How he's going to set them up and how he's going to how he's how is he going to get them to play? Because almost that's almost more important than you know who he selects. Aside from someone like, you know, Farrell, who I think will make a big difference. He said if he's playing in a certain way and there's a real identity to what England are doing, then, you know, it should be, no matter who goes into that place, they should know what they're doing and you should have the consistent type of game plan. And I don't think we have seen that. I don't think it has been consistent. So can you turn things around really quickly? Unbelievably quickly. And any coach that says, oh, I'm going to need, you know, three years to bed in here, that's that's not it. You need yeah. to get in fast. And Eddie did buy himself time in this Six Nations. You know, he, this idea of the third generation of <laughs> Eddie Jones teams for England was really smart, wasn't it? Nobody's talking about, or few are talking about, he has to go. It's because he it's all of a sudden he's the new coach, isn't he? He's the yep. new England third generation coach. He's which, smart on the field and smart off it as well. well. He, you get he to is. be that way, I suppose. He, you know, he is. And, and, Few, there seem few options at the moment other than him and I don't think it would be smart for them to change at horses at this time in the in the cycle and I think you do have to back him but I would like to see you know how he's presented to the RFU and said actually how I'm getting from the position we're in now into a position that you know what is it wins a World Cup is that is that the expectation you know there's a big big journey to go from what we've seen over the last two years yeah. to winning a World Cup and in order to do it it's not enough just to say, I'll get one or two players back. It's, I have to show you something, you know, almost entirely new just to counter what's going on against the big teams or to allow us to exploit the talents that we have against the very, very best. So I assume that presentation has been made or it's underway. <laughs> I'm entirely sure that's going to get shared with us, unfortunately. We will ask. Um, you mentioned the fact that, I, and I think you're probably absolutely right, I don't think there's going to be any change. I think there are a few have been very clear on that. And I think if you are looking for someone to take you into a World Cup, his IP and his track record and having been there and done it in an environment which I think is getting increasingly pressurised. I mean, these World Cups now are becoming, it's not just about what you do on the field, it's about who's in the squad, it's about what you do off the field. 
he's been there and he's done it. And and I think the RFU will hope that they've still got the right man for that. Just before we talk about some of the runners and riders who are popping their hands up above the parapet for post the Eddie Jones era, just online, we, we spent a lot of time lauding France off the back of just, just a wonderful weekend in Paris. And we've spoken a bit about Wales along the way. Are Ireland happy with where they sit right now? And I, I sort of put that in the context of the old joke of peaking between World Cups and never mu- quite managing to roll it into a World <sighs> Cup. And, you know, second in the tournament this year, very, very bold in, t- in coming back in Paris and otherwise, you know, a triple crown and, and, and comfortably so. Are Ireland quietly sitting under the radar thinking we've got room for growth and we're all right right now? I don't know. Or we're thinking we're doing it again. We're doing it again. <laughs> Which one we're is peaking, it? We're peaking mid-tournament. If this is the sort of dilemma that Ireland are in and that we will be having this conversation until Ireland get to a semi-final of a World Cup at the, uh, uh, at the minimum. And we've never done that. You're doing that wonderfully Irish thing of just downplaying everything and sort of panicking about it. And <sighs> But it's, I don't think, I'm not, I, the way we're playing at the moment is great. I think Ireland are happy. Um, and actually across the board in, in Ireland and, you know, the different components, so you've got the team, got, you know, media and commentators and you've got Irish fans. And I, you know, it's fairly consistent at the moment that people have enjoyed the type of rugby that's being played. Um, some of the results, you know, being New Zealand, even the performance against France and parts was really good. You know, a good win um, against England as well under weird circumstances and, and, and then winning a triple crown as well. So I think there's a general happiness to what Ireland have done, especially because for those f- first couple of years under Farrell, it, it was like the f- rugby was not good. And he'll remember it. It was, there was too often that we'd be in our own 22, box kick, box kick, box kick, and it would be box kick up the, the line. It's like, oh, come on, can we not, can we not try something else here, lads? And then we got into this terrible habit. One of the first plays in the, in the Six Nations last year, we, we took a ball, we got up to halfway, and we had a resource to spit at either side. You thought, all right, attacking options here, he go either way. And Conor Murray co- kicks a box kick from the middle of the field, from almost the centre circle, kicks it onto their 22. It's like, is that all we have? Is that what we're reduced to here? Was last year's Six Nations the, the dire tournament? I'm trying to think. The Autumn Nations Cup the year before was a Appalling, yeah, it? that wasn't good. But if we were in a sort of an anti-rugby phase, yes. And I think, and we'll come back to this in a minute because I think the the summer had a lot to do with the change that we've seen as well. It did start before that, but the summer definitely changed it. So they were playing this, um, you know, really poor style of rugby. So even when they were getting results, it just felt, you know, just didn't feel great. Mm. So it was a nasty taste in the mouth, and then. Of course, now it's it's where when a result doesn't go Ireland's way, they actually have a bit of you know money in the bank. It's like you know you're trying to do things the right way, so there's a lot of positivity around the team at the moment. But in order to sort of cash that in, the trajectory has to keep yep. on going, doesn't it? Yeah. So we had this weird situation, brilliant against Wales. I thought really outstanding. Then France, we missed an opportunity there. We, you know, we had a little bit of a backslide from our style as well. It's a little bit of a backslide. So that was disappointing. Then Italy was kind of farcical. England was, again, kind of unusual game. Like that was not what you'd expect. And then Scotland was was very strong, but it, it wasn't dazzling. And, mm. and that was a weird game as well, just because of the way the tournament panned out and what was going on at the Scotland camp. So there's definitely a feeling for this summer that we probably, this is it now, we need to go to somewhere else and we need to maybe, you know, not see win after win, but we need to see the same style of rugby and that um, continuity between forwards and backs and the highly skilled game and attacking game that we're, we're, we, we've seen implemented uh, in the summer. And I think as long as that happens, that sort of feeling of, oh, we're going all right, we're progressing here nicely, that will keep going and people will be happy. But, this is the next, this next year is, is the really important one. You can have a brilliant year out, two years out from the, from the World Cup and it means nothing. Yeah. It means nothing. Have you got to win a test in New Zealand to genuinely feel good about Rugby World Cup 2023? I think so. I really? think there's certain milestones that you have to hit. And I always talk about that English team that won the World Cup in 2003 and they went down to New Zealand and beat them in their own backyard yeah. and they were physical and they were, you know, I didn't think we could ever do really well in the World Cup without beating New Zealand a few times along the way, right? In the build-up. 
Now we've done that. We've beaten the South Africa's, beaten Australia's. New Zealand was a big issue for us. We've now done it. And it's not that New Zealand doesn't hold fear, but it's something different if yeah. you haven't beaten them in... Well, you've beaten them three and five. Yeah, I know. It's a really, it's the Yankees yeah. never lost to them, I think, I'm right <laughs> saying. It's extraordinary. And, yeah, and um, Conor Murray has a like, ridiculous yeah. um, uh, record with them as well. So, so that's a milestone that we have now, you know, we, we've ticked that off. Now to beat them down there, I think takes another big jump. Yeah. It's a really, really big jump. So I think there are certain milestones and that probably is one if you want to be really successful. It doesn't guarantee success, but I think without it, success uh, becomes more difficult. I'm really glad where we are at the moment in terms of positive rugby being rewarded a bit. Yeah, Because I think we spoke after the, the Lions series and it was like, I don't know where the sport is going actually yeah. and like, I, I love rugby I love international yeah. rugby especially and I love the Lions but that was borderline unwatchable <laughs> you know it was borderline unwatchable and I think I don't know if it was sort of a collective mindset with sort of coaching but definitely refereeing has changed a little bit and yeah. it, it's it's supported attacking play and it's working and, and rugby is cyclical anyway it goes up through you know sometimes kicking is, is, is dominant really strong line speed and defences but we're in a moment at the moment where good rugby is being rewarded as well one of the biggest talking points around that Lions series or certainly our coverage of it on Sky was the four and a half second delay between myself and Ronan O'Gara every question it was like one of those sketches where they answer the question before I don't know if you saw any of that <laughs> yes yeah I know the one yeah. um, but, but by the way that's not just because there was a delayed leak Ronan is slow <laughs> his delivery gears, you can hear so, the clunking getting I going did, I did four years with, with, with Ronan uh, over in, uh, in Ireland on, on Virgin Media and he likes to ponder a, yeah. a, an answer. There's no doubt about it. Dramatic pause. He didn't do too much pausing this week when he was asked by Craig Doyle on BT Sport, would you be interested in the England job? Yeah, it would be a great job, I think, actually, he said. Yeah, what a team. There's so much potential there. There's serious rugby players and serious passion for the game in England. It's a cracking job. We'd love to have a go off that. We're talking about Eddie Jones being very good on the pitch and very good off it. Is that Ronald O'Gara genuinely saying, England, I'm interested, or is that him playing contract negotiations? Is although, that I'm, although I'm very happy in my current role, although I of do course. very much enjoy yeah, where I yeah. currently am. But what an honour would be! Yeah. Could you ever see that scenario come oh, true? Oh yeah, I could see it in a, in, a, in a minute. It, well, listen, the coach of uh, of England, head coach of England, or even you know an, an assistant role. It's a massive, massive. There's fewer bigger, there's fewer bigger jobs in, in world rugby. Probably none, possibly none. And I understand, you know, a chap can make a comfortable enough living from it as well. So that may, may be a factor. And he's a professional coach. So um, there's only so many, you know, jobs out there and top jobs in England is is one of them. So um, I think he's also said he'd coach Leinster as well. So he's really... Oh, well, he, he likes <laughs> shaking a stick at the hornet's nest. But that's it. Like if you're, if you're a professional coach, you go, what are the best jobs? And undoubtedly... England is is one of the best jobs. Although it would see, it is it would be strange, wouldn't it? Well, I was going to say, what would the what would the reaction be in the Limerick Times? Oh, an obituary of sorts, yeah. uh, black armbands. But listen, is it any weirder than Andy Farrell, who was you know lauded across you know two different codes, captain of England as well, when it was um, assistant coach of England. His son is c- captain of England. And he's coaching against him for Ireland. That's super weird as well. I still can't get my head over that, by the way. I can't. How he, as a sort of invocative, um, sort of passionate, verbose guy in the lead up to games against his son, say, and everyone targets the 10-12. Oh, yeah. So what's he saying to them? Yeah. Like, and, and, and it's always, you know, there can sometimes be a bit of salty language involved as well. <laughs> you reckon? <laughs> so what's that like? So that's not any weirder than, than Ronan um, coaching, coaching England, but I don't see it happening anytime soon. Owen has never given a glimpse of anything other than it's a game of rugby. Has Andy ever given anything in the Irish press to the question, no, it, how, you, how do you find it going up against your boy? It's always um, raised, but I I kind of like, it's, it's a three-hour show for me. Like when they're retired, I just would like to yeah. hear all about it and go into the depth, how they manage it, because I'm only, I can only think about my own dad and, you know, his uh, experience of, of me playing for Ireland. Yeah. And you know, because he's your like key, is he yeah. New Zealander? Yeah, yeah, he is, but like completely abandoned them right. like yeah, immediately. Yeah. It was yeah. like, oh no, it's Ireland 100% now. Yeah, so uh, him and how you, yeah, and now having kids yourself, that you, you know, it's it's total child first yeah. and you want their success, and that's how you derive yeah. pleasure as well. And that's your and harrow. that's your and, that, and then your job is to stop that. 
Yeah. Get the psychologist out here around the table. This is what you should be pitching. Not bringing me in here and too, lad. Get the two Farrells in here. We're trying. Here. We're get trying. A, yeah. Get a psychologist in and let's talk this out and, and, and bring mum uh, uh, in as well. Yeah. Christ alive. And, and remember, it's not just, this isn't an amateur sport as well. I mean, this is jobs on the line. This stuff. is jobs on the yeah. line. It's potentially jobs on the line. It's careers. It's, it's success and it's your ability to be able to provide for your family as well. How, 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 insane it is I, I, I just don't know I can remember Graham Simmons doing a feature with Andy and Owen when Andy and Owen played together for Saracens mm. and I think they were both wearing Saracens kit and Owen had you know sort of peroxide fringe down and, and you know Andy was still I think at that point in the England squad and I, I, I have vague memories of Andy saying I will let him win at nothing whether yeah. it's ping pong or it's running around the garden he, he will get no, no change out of me at all and they both laughed about it but that possibly is just. I do share that uh, uh, that experience with my dad as right. well. Oh, he wouldn't let you beat. He yeah. wouldn't beat you in that. And he was pretty good, and he is good at everything as well. So it was always the game of pool, and then beats you in the one game of pool, then walks off. Yeah, exactly. No, it's like <laughs> cued out of yeah, the way. Yeah. Just sort of going back to the Rog thing before we come on to to Andy Farrell. Would Rog be a good coach of England? Yeah, I think he'd be a good coach of anyone. I think he's got. Um, an exceptional rugby brain. I think he's got a very good schooling. Um, he's certainly not kind of a product of uh, a Munster environment that he thinks this is, you know, I'm a, he's a Munster back coach from that time. Mm. Um, it's not that at all. He's, if you look at what he's done, it's probably been one of the smartest career trajectories of, of anybody in coaching. Yeah. Um, and he's always been on a quest for rugby knowledge and if you look at the teams and the way he's set up teams um, where he's had more influence and that's been in the last couple of years that he's taken the best bits of, I think, um, the Munster philosophy and culture and understood, you know, the collective nature of teams and passion and being connected to your locality and um, finding a, a style of rugby that suits that group of players. So yeah. he's done all those, but without being a model of what Munster did in the in the noughties. He's it's 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 painfully not that. And I think we were seeing a big influence from his time in New Zealand. The, the Crusaders. The Crusaders. Yeah, I think you can see that the the risk um, that is he's he's much he's risk happy. I think as opposed to being risk averse, he understands that ball goes on the deck, but you have to make opportunity in, in order to succeed. And I think he trusts, you know, the individual maybe more so. He's slightly more individual minded than the total sort of mechanic of the of the um, team, which is probably more Irish. Ireland's more of a, this is the system that we're working in and our system is, is really good. It's a Joe Smith thing. Yeah. That the system is great and, and the best players excel in that system. Whereas um, I think there's a sort of slightly more individual nature of, of top 14. Uh, extracting the the one on one type of of uh, opportunity, and that's I think very very New Zealand as well. But he, he's, he, you know, I've had some great conversations with him about, you know, where he his original mindset was uh, from coming from Munster or just you know like any of our would what our experiences, and then that changing quite sort of dramatically by the experiences that that he's had over the last number of years so he's definitely evolving as a coach as yeah. I said probably the smartest you know basis for a long term really successful career which I suggest is not going straight into the England job now like and so although he's right to say what he 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 said that's not a step that's not his next step you know there's a step down the road for that or the Ireland job or, or an international level but I don't think that's his immediate next step the, the thing that's interesting is obviously having done Racing where you control your players and then you go to New Zealand where you're very much part of that pyramid structure and everything feeds up to the All Blacks and now back in France again. I just wonder whether the challenge, and, and particularly having come from Ireland, which is you know the four provinces into the national team, I just wonder whether the challenge of 12 separate clubs and I think relations are very good between club and country at the moment in England, but whether that and all the circus that goes around in the media, etc., whether that makes the job... I mean, if you're a coach looking at what Eddie Jones is going through now, do you think, I want to get into that because I know I can deal with it, or do you think, Christ... You know, if you're a professional coach, you know, you're you're sort of built slightly different anyway. You're going to be massively ambitious because right. you kind of have to be because there's not that many okay jobs in rugby. There's top jobs, really, isn't there? You know, if you're top 14, anybody who's working at that level, you know, that's a good level to be working at. Same in... Um, 
the um, United Rugby Championship, same in the Premiership, um, or if you have a uh, an international job. There's not that many jobs. So, you know, if you're backing yourself to be, I'm going to be one of these players or one of these coaches that has one of these very few jobs, you've got a bit of ego about you anyway, and, and you're very ambitious. So, uh, and if you, again, harping back onto the way Ronan has built his career, it, it strikes me as someone who's in this for the long run, he's extremely committed to um, sort of maximising what he can do and, and ultimately ending up with the very, very top jobs in, in rugby. Yeah. Because um, I don't think he'll be uh, happy with La Rochelle, even though that's a brilliant job and he may very well be happy with it now. But will he, you know, is that the end of the Ron Lagar story? Are you kidding me? You know, there's no way. That's one of the stepping stones to something else. I don't know what that will be. I don't know if he'd want Munster. I don't know if, you know, he'd want Leinster if it came up. I don't know. Um, you know, would he want Ireland at some point? I'd say he probably would. And would he but want... There's, would, there's something written in the stars there, isn't it, with him and, and O'Connell? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I don't know if I... I, know, I don't think it's as necessarily as just putting, you know, these two coaches together and then, you know, that's your dream team. I think... You know, both of those are individuals as well, and I'm sure Paulie might have his own ambitions. And but like Andy Farrell's not going anywhere unless you guys poach. What him. I was going to say <laughs> is he? Do you um, think? Do you think it's? I will. That that was the question, really. I mean, there's obviously been a lot of talk because I wanted to ask you about Farrell and Stuart Lancaster, obviously with your Leinster hat on. I mean, has there been any pickup in Ireland about the clamour for Andy Farrell to come back? And I think I think the clamour's probably died down now, but in the immediate aftermath of. Paris, the journalists were out and there were polls who should come back and Lancaster and Farrell were at the top. Sean Edwards was mentioned as well. Has has any of that had any cut through? I'm not as on top of that as as uh, maybe uh, uh, as I should be, but I didn't feel, oh my God, we're, we're in danger of losing yeah. Andy Farrell. I don't think it sort of got to that pitch. There's always been chatter around uh, Stuart Lancaster, maybe not for the England job, because I don't, I don't know if that's even an option anymore. What would both of those guys, if they came and said, listen, not that we want you to interview it, but we want you to take this role. Would they take it? Um, uh, you know, Farrell will be leaving a, a very good role with a good team that are on a good trajectory at the moment. And a good and, system and in you which said to, to build. Not from. dealing with, certainly dealing with some uh, pressure from the media, but not nothing like mm. the sort of outside of rugby issues that you have to deal with if you're England coach. And that is a big deal. It is a big deal, Ian. And you need to be a certain type of um, individual to deal with that. And, you know, it was one of the things that Stuart Lancaster, I know, I know felt very challenged by. And, and, and he wanted to be a coach on the pitch. And it's difficult to be the coach on the pitch. Well, impossible to be the coach on the pitch exclusively if mm. you're an England coach. That's, that's a part of it and it's an important part of it, but it's not the main part, I don't think. No, it is the media and it's, it's the circus that goes around. I know Stuart put a huge amount of time into the community game as well. The, the interesting thing about Stuart is obviously there's been enormous success with Leinster. Is that, and, and I'm interested in where you see that balance between Leo Cullen, who's your old teammate, and, and what Stuart Lancaster is doing. I mean, is, is, is Stuart Lancaster sort of parked that England experience a rejuvenated man because of what he's done with Leinster and therefore maybe the time is right? I mean, I'm not, I'm trying to think of other people who've done it, gone away and come back again. There aren't many, I don't think. Yeah. Or, or It's hard to go back. It's because rugby is a pyramid. So, you know, everybody's, you're, you're going well and you go from one level to the next level, you know, and then all of a sudden you're managing at, uh, or coaching at, at international level. And then it's it can very often be the sort of end of people's careers, mm. isn't it? Like it, no nobody really, you know, or very few, and that's why you know Eddie has, has booked a trend that, that keep on going and delivering success and in, in, in multiple international jobs. It tends to be that's the per, that top of the pyramid, and then then you fall away. Now I think because Lan Lancaster got that job early and you know delivered a long way to, to, to towards what he should have delivered but then had a disastrous world cup i wasn't sure if if you know he was almost capable of sort of that sort of you know rehabilitation and the big thing that i was concerned about when he was connected to the lancer job was he was all about building uh, a type of philosophy if you remember yeah. the team and and you know i thought he'd he'd done a really good job on that but then at the most crucial minute which was the World Cup, he balked at it and he changed it. If you remember, he brought in Farrell quite late and he ended up, he brought in 
Burgess. Sam Burgess, yeah. Dropped and then, Luther Burrell. Yeah, he, he dropped Ford. And I was like, and then that undermined everything that he was trying to do in yeah. an instant. That undermined it. And I think that was the key issue to why uh, uh, England didn't succeed at that World Cup. And then I was like, listen, where, once you've done that, you know, where do you come back from? But he, I think more than anything else, is now lauded in, in Leinster as a brilliant, brilliant technical coach. I was speaking to Rob um, Kearney uh, on the other week and he just thinks he, he is phenomenal. Phenomenal. I know Sexton thinks he's phenomenal. Detail on everything. They absolutely, you know, they, they think he's top, top. If you put people in the right positions, what they can achieve relative to square pegs and round holes. Well, that's, that's interesting as well. So not everybody is a fit for that top job, especially yeah. top job for England. Yeah. But, you know, there's a different role that you can fit in that you can absolutely, you know, kill it. And, you know, Leo, you said, what's the balance between Leo and him? Well, you know, maybe Leo is not that coach either, but no. you don't need to be that coach. Not everyone needs to be everything. What you need to be is the coach that can facilitate a Stuart Lancaster within your setup, empower him to deliver what he what he's best at and reap the rewards of it as a collective. And... Um, so you have to say kudos to, to Leo for being able to do that. And much like, listen, uh, Andy Farrell, who brought in um, or was willing to bring in uh, Paul O'Connell. And it has definitely made a, a, a big difference. And it's unfair to say, well, it's, you know, it's, it's a happy coincidence that Paul has come in and the, the, the style of play has changed and the performance has changed. You know, I'm sure Paul O'Connell's had an influence on that. I know technically he has a of influence. It's very obvious, but that's not a bad thing with Andy Farrell. That's a positive in my book yeah. that he's been able to build a team around him that makes a, a difference, and it not sort of you know not for him to be worried about that because it, ultimately it's how his team are performing and how his coaching taking are delivering, which is which is most um, important. So kudos for him for you know, bringing him into the fold. A penny for either of their thoughts at this point in time. I, I think it's, it's quite clear that Eddie Jones, and actually everything you're saying around Stuart Lancaster in 2015 and the the circus that goes with a Rugby World Cup, I know it's not a home tournament, but it's only over the ditch and there's going to be intense speculation. You need a broad set of shoulders to be able to deal with that. And perhaps that's why the RFU are conscious that Eddie Jones yeah. has still got a, a lot more cards to play. So do you think... Lancaster would have his head turned by the, by that job, or 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 any other head coach job, or does he? You think he? Th uh, and that's not to say he's going to stay with Leinster all the time because you know he'll, he'll invariably move for Leinster, but maybe he'll take up the head job at, at some point with Leinster, depending on what you know Leo wants to do. I think Leo's only just signed another one year agreement, so I don't know what potentially he, he where he wants to move to or what he wants to do with his career. So that's an option. But I'm wondering, you think what we've just discussed here and finding the right role. Yeah. to deliver for your your skill set as a coach. Yeah. Do you go, well, maybe head coach isn't the job for me. Yeah. And even if England came calling, I'd go, no, we've gone there. No, I'm not going to do it. Or is the lure too or strong? Is the itch too big that yeah. you need to scratch it? I think only he can answer that, really. But I think, I mean, it would be a hell of a story. Yeah. Well, he comes back. I think he, he would come back in a better position. You know, he's, yes. he's now fated in Ireland. I think there's a general acknowledgement that, you know, he is, a, you know, as important a part as anything in what Leinster are doing and, and the success they've had over the over the time that he's been there. Um, so that kudos that he would bring into an England changing room, I think would be a, a long ways ahead of what he went in originally with. Yes. And I was just thinking of Graham Henry, who blew 2007 and 111, and Clive Woodward, who lost 99 and 103. And obviously they stayed in the jobs through, but I, I suppose those that get the second chance often learn from what they've been through before. Yeah, and and again, listen, we're, we're talking about Andy Farrell a, a lot here, but you're not the you're not the finished article the first day in the job. No. And especially with someone who's never been head coach before. And Andy Farrell had never been head coach, so there is something... And again, it's another reason why I'm kind of thinking, well, is this the right appointment? Because it took him two years to find his feet. And and if you're willing to accept that and go, right, we're willing to let this guy grow on the job in the international team, then that's okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would think it would be unusual to appoint someone as the you know, head coach of the national side who hasn't had a, a job as a head coach elsewhere. And you know, Ron Nogara is the is, is showing you the the path to one of these elite jobs 
is through you know different type of, of coaching skills, more importance, gradually up to head coach. How do you do on that? And now this is the point where you go, right, he does a he's this is his first year as a head coach. He needs a little bit more. And then, you know, what are the other options here? Yeah. Who'd have thought English eyes would be quite so focused on all things Irish rugby at the moment and the, the comings and goings. If I was to give you a pound now, who would you put on as the next England head coach? There's a lot of chat about promoting from within, possibly Rob Baxter, yeah, I think, who said I, I don't know what the job is. I Steve was going to say that. I was going to say that. I don't know if they'll go, I don't think they'll go overseas. Is there someone from the outside to, to bring in? I'm not sure. Um, would they look at promoting someone who's had success like Rob Baxter? You could, yeah, and I think maybe they would. I think they might look for Englishmen this time round. And of course, um, Mr. Cech is doing uh, RG. So. Oh, hello. <laughs> Have you spoken to him since yeah. his take out? I haven't spoken to him since, uh, which is terrible on, on my behalf. But, what do you uh, make of the appointment? I think it's good because I think Cech will get a job done for you. I think in, in terms of sort of invigorating a team, uh, exciting them, setting forth a sort of game plan that works. He's he's brilliant, you know. He's smart. He's so smart. And I know he's like a few um, uh, rough edges. Yeah, well, I was going to say putting a flammable character into a flammable environment. <laughs> Something spectacular. Yeah, I mean, you happen. don't want you don't. They don't want a sort of a, a shrinking violet either, do no. they? They want someone with a bit about them, and he can inspire as well. But I think RG have been, you know, it's been a tough story for them of the yeah. last couple of years, you know, everything that they've had to go through in terms of the difficulty of playing in the international games. I really felt, I felt for them. Hank has sort of looked like it was going to be spectacular and then just, it, it all became quite a sort of same, same environment. Yeah. It? And just, you know, the one team, it's, it's, that yeah. structure is difficult as well. Yeah. So listen, that is a massively difficult role, but, you know, Czech is a proven winner. Watch this space. I want to get your thoughts on this weekend's Heineken Champions Cup playoff games. Before that, I wanted to ask you a quick question, given we were talking about Stuart Lancaster and Leo Cullen, just about, we don't talk a lot about the Ultimate Rugby Championship, but is there a bit of a danger that it's becoming a bit Celtic and Rangers in the Scottish Premier League? Leinster have won six of the last nine and four on the bounce. Is anyone going to get their 10 points clear this year as well? Is anyone going to well, get close to them well, in that league? The problem is it's not a Celtic and Rangers there at the moment. It's just a Celtic. It's just a Celtic, yeah. You know what I mean? It's just sort of... Yeah, I, I think though, but one or two massive rivalries is enough to sustain a league. You know, certainly a, a league that's still finding its feet. It's the addition of new teams. I, I think that um, that would be fine. The, the problem is that um, it's not quite there yet but that said Leinster are, are very dominant um, the structure means that you know you still have you know um, knockout scenario you've got you know you, you get Leinster on on the wrong day and you have your very best day and um, you know they they can falter in that competition it's outside of it in the EPCR it's slightly different problem is you know Leinster can really bully a lot of the teams in the in that tournament and sort of win at a counter and, and they played Munster at the weekend you know which is traditionally a, you know a really hostile environment and and you know tight tight game it wasn't a tight game you know Ireland um, Leinster won with a with a bonus point Munster didn't get one and uh, so it was 5-0 very very comfortable and that's not great you know that's not great for for Irish rugby and it's not great for the tournament either but below that it's actually, you know, there's a, there's a lot of competitive games and some good games. I think the South Africans, I think it's difficult marrowing the two hemispheres, but they definitely have the the new teams this year. The Stormers have, are, are going okay. They've made a difference. It's it's a better product than it has been over the last number of years, but it's not perfect and they need a, a period now when it's, when it's being bedded in and the teams and the structure exists as it is for a period of time. I think it's being viewed much more widely as well, which is great because it's it's um, um, a, a free to air footprint as well, yeah. and that makes a difference. Um, so um, I've, I'm sort of optimistic about it. I have to say, I'm optimistic about it. But Leinster's to lose this year. The way Leinster are at the moment, why are they so much further ahead? Not just of the other three Irish provinces, but of all the teams in it. So in, in this part of the world. They have a brilliant feeder system. Yeah. They have uh, an extremely um, competitive um, underage system based largely in the school's system, which has been a generator of most of the, of the talent that's come through Leinster in the last few years, but not exclusively because they have a club system that's very good as well. There is a massive desire to play for Leinster for anybody that's playing rugby in Leinster. It's the holy grail. It's massive. It's, it's really huge. And that was something 
that it has increased, you know, over time as well. So it is a lot of kids that pick up a rugby ball. Their dream is to play for Leinster one day, and that's kind of that kind of shows. Then you've got the volume of um, of players underage, both in the in, uh, youth system and, and the school system, which is big. Then you've got a very very well developed and established a sort of feeder funnel system. So um, they've got what was previously called the um, um, development squads and they've like a, or the academy and sorry the sub academy all filtering in delivering you know one or two or even sometimes three really good senior players every year and um, so that is just a conveyor belt and it has been the, the, the issue now with Ireland is it's like that's the foremost conveyor belt which is sort of cannibalizing everything else so you'll see there's you know I think there's about maybe five players um, left are leaving Leinster at the end of the season, going to the other provinces yeah. as well. Now, there's always been a bit of that, but it's more pronounced than than, than ever. Um, and they are, you know, they are they are a machine that is quite a long way ahead of everybody else in that championship. And that in itself provides a challenge for its for them when they get into the deep deep um, knockout stages of of Europe, because what works easily for them again, in, in the um, United Rugby Championship, um, isn't isn't there or it doesn't work as easily in EPCR. Interesting. It is the envy, I think, of, of many a sort of coach at the moment, just the setup that's flying through in and around Leinster. Let's move it on to the Champions Cup round of 16. Interestingly, we've got two-legged ties this time around. Are you across all of this? Yeah, no. We were a bit surprised sort of halfway through the season <laughs> with the T's and C's that have been changed. <laughs> but for the listeners who, who dabble in and uh, dip in and dip out, so we've got two-legged ties, which I think will make for a fascinating couple of weekends. We've got no Welsh teams in the mix after a bad Six Nations quick word on Wales. It's strange because um, we've always said, oh, it doesn't matter the, the, how the regions are performing. It doesn't matter. Um, Wales will deliver. And it didn't happen this year. And, and maybe that's sort of, you know, chicken coming home to roost to some, to some degree but I will say this they weren't playing well they didn't have you know I know there were players down here and there but they always kind of delivered Wales didn't yeah. they like through the Six Nations way it's, more than the sum of their parts for a very long way time way more and you do you, there's so much to admire about them and they're kind of the anti-Scotland yeah. you know your expectations are always really low and they deliver really high whereas yeah. Scotland expectations are through the roof and then they sort of somehow don't show up whatsoever not, not uh, going north of the border anytime soon <laughs> <laughs> but you know listen that's that's you know ask somebody north of the border I, I don't think I'm um, I don't think that's a new uh, an opinion no, you know but but Wales have been and they you know they delivered despite sort of weird circumstances this year and, and had some you know, really good performances, but I do think it's um, there's there is some troubling times there, isn't there? Yeah, I think it's a little a little worrying. Ryan Jones actually was very strong a few weeks ago with us, just saying that dig not that deep, and you can see some real problems. So we'll watch that with interest. Let's have a quick scoot through the fixtures. Connacht Leinster round one on Friday night. Leinster win there; they're bound to win at home. What can Connacht do if anything? Well, it's um. You know, Connacht have, have have been playing really well. They've got a really good coach. They've got a, a really good ten. They've got um, a, a, an attacking philosophy that uh, means that they probably have uh, more interesting teams to watch in the championship. And and Leinster's quality aside, might be the most fun team to watch in 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 the United Rugby Championship. But I think that they're going to struggle. <laughs> <laughs> they are, they are, they are, they're yeah. not. I think yeah. they are, just because Leinster are so good and, and yeah. Leinster, you know, can sort of beat you a number of ways and over two legs, you think it's very difficult to yeah. see how they they couldn't win that um, and won't win it. Um, but I think it might be a more fun game. Connick will go for it. You know, yeah. they'll go for it. They will definitely throw some ball. They They kick smartly. A little bit lightweight in their pack, but... They um they sort of play the style that sort of maximizes what they do as well. So um and they'll 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 fancy the game, you know. This they'll they'll definitely fancy it. But yeah, over two legs, I think Leinster are too good. As I said, they can beat teams in a certain way um, in the United Rugby Championship and almost all the way up to this round in this yeah. competition as well. It's it's when a couple of the things that they find very easy are taken away from them in the later um, in the later rounds of this tournament by teams that won't be necessarily physically bull bullied yes. or can you know in a, in a flash yeah change uh, what they're doing 
um, that's when it becomes a little bit trickier. And also, if you're not playing against those sort of teams week in, week out, you're not necessarily tempered for battle in the way you might be. Rog takes La Rochelle to bordeaux Begler, where obviously on-pitch action will be presumably highly entertaining, potentially off the pitch as well. Did you see the little touchline? I did, fracar? yeah. It was very Ron Nogara. Was it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, not, not Normally, get, Nobody's got people there to finish yeah, it for him, yeah. isn't he? No, he's, he's good at, in his playing days, he was quite good at getting in the face and then, well, lads, yeah, where are you? Yeah, are you coming? For those of you who don't know what we're talking about, I'm just reading a, a match report. Tempers boiled over on the touchline at the Stade Shaban Delmas at the weekend with Ron Nogara angrily celebrating an incident just before halftime only to be confronted by the Bordeaux Begler head coach, Christophe Urios. This guy is unbearable, Urios told the French press. I regret that the fourth or fifth referee did not do his job. How can we enter the field? How do we connect people? He's really lucky. He goes to the stands. He gets into the men at the edge of the field. He's unbearable. Are you telling me that it must already go to the committee? I don't care. It's over. I've moved on. I don't care about him. I was going to care about him because they meet again this weekend. Um, again. Is that it, Rog just sort Again, of, if you're surprised at yeah, a bit of salty language yeah, for yeah, Rog, I think, uh, you know, you're, um, they, you've, um, you don't know Ronan, but... Um, what, what, what do you, I mean, yeah. He's, that, listen, he, part and parcel of the game. That's what it is. A bit of passion. People are fired up. It does add a nice little um, quirk to the game um, this weekend, certainly, but... Um, yeah, I think uh, Roland's well able to to show his emotions, and and he spends a lot of time down on the field as well. Yeah. He does he does do that. I've noticed that pacing from him. and gesticulating. He likes a, likes a bit of he fires up his team, and and they react. They won that game. I think the kick in the yeah. last uh, last moments. So, and they um, obviously lost the final last year. We often talk. We spoke for years on Sky about the fact that teams have to go through that process at the sharp end of the tournament. Munster did it for a number of years. Leinster did it a few times, etc. Saracens also got close without ever winning it until. They learn how to break it. I mean, a La Rochelle on that trajectory of teams who are capable yeah, now. They were capable. They could have won that game and they could be the champions now. You yeah. know, it, it wasn't as if they were sort of beaten out the gate. And the, I thought the way Ronan set them up in the final was actually 100% right. And yeah. if, you, if you remember it, they, were, they had a very, very good first half. Um, and then there was, you know, a couple of, you're, you're talking against uh, maybe a generational uh, Toulouse team as well. So um, that was always going to be a bit of a struggle. But um, if they, they, they'll be in the mix again, I think they, you know, they, they'll probably win that over two legs. And then it's not, it's not that difficult as a hop, skip and jump to a, yeah. to a trophy. Sail and Briz, you're doing Sail and Briz actually at the weekend. Yep. Does that feel like a two-legger? The way both are playing at the moment, I know, you know, Bristol probably... Um, you know, over the course of the season, I have, I have bigger expectations, but I don't feel either of those teams sort of challenging at the at the right at the business end of the yeah. tournament. Do you like they are? They are the second sort of grade um, English teams left in the competition. So I'm sure there'll be you know claret spilt at the weekend and <laughs> <laughs> the next couple of weekends. But you know, you're going through the list of of all the teams here. There's a lot of sort of aristocrats of of yeah. of uh, European rugby here and. You know, a brilliant fixture between Stade Vansai and, and Racing. You can imagine, you know, whoever comes out on that is going to be formidable. Montpellier versus Harlequins. And if Harlequins get going as well, I, I think, then they are the, they're one of the key sort of challengers from the English perspective. Any hope for Ulster? Bon chance as they travel to Toulouse. Not really fair having... Did you see Dupont's oh, yeah, magic yeah, of the yeah, weekend? Yeah. So good. Listen, it's just... I want a highlights reel from him every yeah. week. And luckily he provides one. He's so spectacular, isn't he? Yeah. He's so good. And... and Ulster have um, not had a couple of um, had a couple of not great weeks, but their trajectory has been positive as well. They've sort of transitioned a lot of their players in the last year as well, so they've got a cohort of young players, especially in the back line that are, you know, are good and will go after it. And if it was another French team, I kind of half fancy Ulster for that, but yeah. I think. To lose are so good at the moment that that becomes very challenging. Some ways, like over the two legs, you know, that's there's a half a chance there for us. Honestly, you need, you need the chance. rain coming up at you at the King's <laughs> Band, as it sometimes does, and a sort of a rash moment from the French visitors. Yeah, next but they've week. got some, they've got some players as well, and and they they're you know they're scoring tries. Um, I just think the sort of power and finesse that Toulouse have um, should should deliver them um, over two legs. You've beautifully. I think, left the, the best two to last, which is Munster's trip to Sandy Park, who, except are not having the finest of times at home at the moment, but, I mean, that has got, that's got real life. Yeah, I mean, it does. struggle to pick a winner out of that. Until yeah, you really be. would. And it's it's two teams that are not sort of dissimilar. There's a little yeah. bit of sheen is off them at the moment. Yeah. And as I said, Munster had a 
really bad performance against uh, Leinster last time out. I don't think Munster are capable of winning Europe this year. They're not good enough, but they're definitely capable of a couple of monster performances and put yeah. themselves in, in good position and, and hugely emotional. And I imagine having not delivered an emotional performance uh, against Leinster, in Thoman, by the way, at the weekend, um, they will be smarting. So there will be there will be a backlash uh, to be felt. And if they if they bring that, then you know extra uh, could be in trouble. But extra are well able to do that as well. Yeah. So uh, that is a proper, I think, 50-50 there. And obviously extra won it a couple of years ago. Yeah. Premiership's not really within their control at the moment. So this is a biggie for them. Claremont Leicester. Yeah. Oh, to have a ticket to the Marcel yeah. Michelin. Yeah, can you I imagine mean, what yeah, that's going to be like? Yeah. Just absolutely box office. Are Leicester playing well enough? Yeah, I think they probably are. Um, and it will be a different challenge for, for Claremont. It won't be, uh, you know, they're not a top um, 14 side. They don't play like that. I think Leicester are at the moment sort of doubling down on being Leicester, aren't they? Yeah. they you know, they're very comfortable in their own skin, which is something they haven't necessarily been for a long time. But it's one of those weird things that, there's a couple of big teams that you need playing really well and back in rugby in the Northern Hemisphere and Leicester are one of those. It's yeah. So they're away for a little while and you're going, we really need them back at the top and then they're back at the top you're going, ah, this, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want them back yeah. there again. Yeah, that is going to be an absolute cracker. Both legs, both legs. Listen, we talk about, you know, EPCR and, and it's... They haven't got it right, the organisers, and it's been it's it's withered on the vine a little bit, which is unfortunate because its predecessor was such an amazing tournament. But you're going through these uh, fixtures this weekend. There's some top class teams, and all that goes before it doesn't really matter that much, does it? Yeah. You know, like the 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 anything before Christmas, yeah. you know, even you know, around Christmas, it's not. It doesn't matter. The fa- the tracks are dry now. There's the teams that are are in this want to be in it. Yes. And as you said, the really good example there is Exeter. Right? Exeter aren't going to win the Premiership this year. Got a hell of a lot to do if they yeah, are going you know, to. So yeah. it, and it's going to be very tricky. But all of a sudden, they have a laser focus on yeah. this. So this time of the year and these fixtures all the way through to the cup final now are deadly, I think. And do you remember when it was in its old incarnation, those back-to-back games in December and the fire and spice. The, I, the one that leaps out is Harlequin's Stade Francais and the Nick Evans drop goal and a week later Harlequin's went and I think Jordan Turner Hall scored and they won at Stade de France. These back-to-back games will be brilliant yeah, because of the fact that what happens this Saturday gets carried over to next yeah, Saturday. Yeah, and that's so weird as well. It's not yeah. something that happens in yeah. very, very rarely. Yeah. We never really get those aggregate score no, games. No, I mean, no, we don't. You when, never... I'm trying to think when or when or what's going to have a memory of doing We used to have sometimes. them in the championship where Bristol kept blowing promotion because they'd win at home and then the following week they'd go away and lose by you know, two points more than they yes. uh, lose by two points more than they, they'd won the previous week. But these aggregate scores are going to be games within games, yeah. which will be fascinating to watch them. How you finish out a game will be yeah. really important. It's 160 minutes. It is. Well, and you, you know, that's minutes, that weird thing where there's a game that's that's won and uh, the the ball comes yes. to the attacking side and do they, you know, do they just yeah. kick it out? And I always found, I always thought, it's, it shows something about a team if they kick it out as opposed to just trying to go and yeah. score another try even though they may already have the bonus point it may not really make anything, any yeah. difference and there's no certainly no aggregate but it always sort of suggests a mindset to me of players who want to play rugby and are into the performance as well as, as just the result yeah. so you, you now have these decisions that we have to be made like, oh well, listen we're, ch- we're at home we're maybe just one score in front we're chasing you know do we kick this ball out yeah. and hopefully we don't get interception yeah. today, you know, and all of a sudden we're in big trouble. Um, so there's a whole myriad of factors that both players and coaches will have to consider that they normally never do. Yeah, you've got me. So it's like away goals. Yes, yes. Which are going Champions yeah. Cup. Asked you for a pound on the England head coach. I'm going to give you a pound to put on the Champions Cup winner this year. It will be? Leinster. Without a shadow of a doubt. Even in Paris? I don't think it's a, it's a, a foregone conclusion. Um, it's more the fact that Leinster haven't won it for a few few years, and um, I think what I s- said to you earlier on about the concern that the way they play in um, their sort of domestic competition uh, affects their delivery on the biggest occasion. I think I think they may have uh, you know identified that and are adapting. They've got just a lot of really really exceptional players um, who are have been delivering for Ireland as well if you look at the back row you look at 9-10 you look at the back three there's a lot of guys who are used to performing at a very high level in a certain style 
and um, delivering really well. So I think that if they're aware enough to recognize that there's a few different ways to beat teams um, and they, they, you know, they concentrate on what's best for that individual team as opposed to what's gone before in their domestic tournament, then um, I think that they might do it. Enjoy your game this weekend. Thank you for coming to see us. Um, hopefully we'll catch up again before too long well We're next time the, the two lads don't bother to show up so, I, I don't know I haven't got a migraine this week I feel sort of <laughs> and we talked about rugby as well We've I know it's unusual about for you I know which for me is a real treat thank you very much indeed always an absolute pleasure just before we go a few bits of news uh, a couple of congratulations in the women's six nations well done Wales who are going extremely well at the moment fantastic to see uh, them producing the goods and well done to our very own Emily Scarrett who scored her 50th try for her country with her first touch of the ball against the Italians at the weekend and, and well done to Simon Middleton's side who are looking pretty comprehensive two from two so far. In theatre world, we're off on our tour in less than a month, would you believe? We would love to see you there. If you haven't got your tickets, do check uh, out our website, goodbadrugby.com. Uh, we've got Ellis coming to Nottingham. We've got Ben Kayser joining us in Oxford. We've got Hamish Watson in Edinburgh, Scott Cornell in Cardiff, Nick Easter up in Newcastle, Mark Quato in Manchester, Jiffy Davis in Swansea, Rory Best in Dublin, and Jeremy Guskett in Bath. Uh, we've also got Sheffield, London, Birmingham, Bath, South End on the hit list with guests to be announced as we head forward. Head to goodbadrugby.com, as we said, to get your tickets. Um, I also very quickly wanted to say uh, get well soon to Ollie Sims, who's 14 years old and has unfortunately been diagnosed with Burkitt's lymphoma. I'm sorry to hear that, Ollie. Uh, apparently, you were diagnosed just five days after playing the best match of your life. Um, you've had great support from across the rugby community and some amazing messages from across the world. Apparently, your mum and dad were going to come and see us in Birmingham in May, but they've had to cancel because of your diagnosis. So we must get something sorted for you and your parents. Um, mum, get back in touch if you'd like to take us up on that. I'm sure we'll have a live show that we'd love to have all three of you two sooner rather than later. And we'll even try and keep Hask to mind his P&Qs. Um, not easily done, but let's see what we can do with that. Um, apparently, Kings Norton Rhinos is your club and they've set you up a GoFundMe page. And Ollie's requested that this money is going to charity to support others less fortunate than him, which is a remarkably noble act. Ollie, get well from all of us and we'll hopefully see you and your parents at a show before too long. Um, just before we go, we wanted to add in a little bit of bonus content for you this week as well, because in the absence of the Hask, in case you're missing him, he has been doing a little bit of extra work on our behalf, I promise. He hosted the Sports Podcast Awards last week. And as part of that, he dished out the Best Sports Documentary Podcast Award to Defiance. It's the legendary sprinter Michael Johnson series, which takes you on a journey through the history of protest in sport and the impact of driving societal change. Actually, Ellis features in there, and Elmer as well, actually, both feature in the series. Um, and it went on to win the audio documentary category at the Sports Journalism Awards. The reason for mentioning it, a multi-award winning show, is that it was produced by our production company, Folding Pocket. We thought it was really interesting. We hope you enjoy it. This is Hask and Michael Johnson. Have a little listen to this. We now welcome one of the biggest sporting legends that has ever been, Michael Johnson from the Defiance podcast. Congratulations, Michael. How are you? Uh, thanks, James. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Very, uh, very excited to talk to you about Defiance and, uh, and, and super excited that we, that we won. Now, you have won a lot of awards and medals in your time. Where does winning this sports podcast award rank in the rest of them? Oh, you know, it, it ranks pretty high. I think people don't understand, you know, that, you know, as an athlete, obviously winning the gold at the Olympic Games, you know, winning world championships. I mean, obviously, that's a, it's a huge honor. But, um, you know, I knew when I started as an athlete and being fortunate to be an athlete that there was going to be a lot of living left to do after I finished my athletic career. And, and that's one of the things that athletes struggle with, I think, is trying to find their place you know, in society after after your sports career. And, you know, for me, it's very important. It has been since I finished my career to to find things that, you know, that I can excel in and that I can enjoy doing as well. But, you know, once you start with that competitiveness, yeah, you want to keep winning, you know. <laughs> and so, uh, so everyone is significant and not necessarily compared to Oh, the Olympics. I think from an outsider standpoint, that would be the case. You know, you'd sort of compare it to the Olympics where at this point it, I'll take every victory I can get. 
It's such an interesting thing you say that because I, I retired from my career as a rugby player in 2019. That very hard adjustment, you sort of do, you say yes to everything, you're doing all, everything, but you're sort of not sure where you fit in. Your identity, for example, was you as a, was, was a runner and this incredible athlete. And then once you retire, what defines you after that? And, if, and I love your attitude. If you're going to do it, let's be the best at it. Yeah, absolutely. Just, I wanted to ask you, obviously, Defiance touches on so many um, kind of key topics, kind of the history and protest in sport. Why did you want to do this? And just how important a message is it? I felt like the timing was really right for this. Um, you know, given all that's been taking place, you know, here in the States, you know, I was, it was a very interesting situation for me in that, um, you know, the summer of 2020, we're in lockdown, you know, during this pandemic and which is a very strange situation. And then you have, you know, on the same day, the murder of George Floyd uh, here in the U.S. And you have this woman, um, uh, Amy Floyd, I actually believe her name was, in Central Park, you know, caught on camera accusing a black man of harassing her um, because she didn't like that he was telling her that she was disobeying the rules. And she tells him that, you know, I'm going to call the police and they're going to believe me instead of you. And it just sort of highlighted just the inequities of society right now and how it's been for so long. And it was an awakening for me. And I think that it was an awakening for many people to see those things take place and felt like it was just time to really um, focus on, you know, those people who, as I watched after that, subsequent to that, you saw all of these young people of all colors and all backgrounds out marching in protest because they wanted fairness in the world and they realized that there isn't fairness in the world and there isn't equality. And so it just made me think, you know, all of these people out there, you know, using their platform, whatever they have to protest for what's right and what they believe in. And it just, uh, so the idea of highlighting those people who have used sport as a tool uh, for change and, and as a platform uh, seemed like the right time. Because it's not always been easy for sports people to have an opinion. You know, I'm, I'm a massive fan of, of American sports, someone that I really admire, LeBron James, for example, um, uh, you know, and, and Colin Kaepernick, when he kind of made these protests, a lot of what society and the media say is, oh, shut up, get on with your sport. You're a sportsman, or even if you're an ex-athlete, you don't know about politics, you don't know about, your, your, you're highly paid. How... How important was it to capture these stories and actually how important is, is it for sports people to, to put their hand up and use their platforms in the right way? Yeah, that's, that's another good point, James, because I think that, you know, what we started to see over the last uh, couple of years is, is to see that change and shift to where, you know, athletes felt a lot more comfortable actually using their platform when you have people like LeBron James and some of the biggest stars in the world, Lewis Hamilton and people like that you know, actually using their platform, it makes it a little bit more safe for, for others to come behind them and sort of opens up, um, uh, you know, a, a situation where people feel that, that, that it's much more comfortable for them. When you see a company like Nike supporting Colin Kaepernick, then you start to see the companies getting involved and saying, hey, you know, we're not going to, you know, shun these people for using their platform. We're going to support them. So I think it, it made it a lot more easy. But I think that that also made a lot of people feel like, well, it's easy. And it's always been easy. And so what we find um, during Defiance and talking to you know, many of those um, athletes who, who, who may have used their platform in the past and hearing those stories, um, it's not an easy decision because there are so, and even today it's still not an easy decision because while you may have the support of sponsors, you may have the support of a lot of your fans, you get a lot of threats, death threats even, um, to yourself and your family and then bringing your family into this thing because we're in a society right now that's so polarized and always has been around these sorts of issues. So it's not an easy decision to make. And I, I think it was important to highlight um, some of the, uh, the issues uh, that those who have used their platform that they've dealt with and, and, and some even, you know, um, suffering uh, bodily harm and, and death threats as a result. It's actually not always been the case as well that the brands and companies have got have got behind them. You know, you've seen sort of a lot of companies say, actually, I don't want anything to do with this. You're, you're too political. You're making a statement. And I think that's one of the most powerful things. And I think that's the only way that's going to change the situation and stop the cancel culture, stop the polarization, is that if people stop listening to the to the masses and actually make proper common sense decisions and, and, and see what's right and what's wrong. Yeah, I think, you know, what we're seeing is that, um, you know, 
everybody has today, everybody has their own opinion and their own idea of what is common sense. There is no collective common sense anymore. There are no collective, uh, there's no collective agreement around what is a fact anymore. So everyone can have their own facts. So I think you're going to continue to see the polarization, but I think that, you know, companies then, to your point, they're very important in this and they're going to have to make a choice, you know, which one, which side are you going to actually sit on? And, um, and I think that most companies understand that, you know, it's a, it's a pretty easy choice to navigate, to, uh, to make. It's a very difficult situation to navigate when you're trying to sell to everyone. Um, and and that's, that's, that's an unfortunate situation for them, but they're going to have to make a choice. And I think they're all seeing that. And I think most are making what I would consider the right choice and what is the common sense choice to me. There are some people who are on the exact other spectrum from where I sit who would say no and they don't have to buy those products. Amen to that. I, I wanted to know the amazing people that you've you've spoken to, was there one particular inspirational story that really struck in your mind and kind of took you by surprise? You know, I think that the story that was probably most that I didn't I knew nothing about was uh, Tony Smith Thompson, who was a, um, a a basketball player, a female basketball player who was playing at um, Manhattanville College, a small liberal arts college up in New York back in 2003. And she was, you know, she now is kind of known as the Colin Kaepernick before Colin Kaepernick. So she, she tells her story um, of how she just couldn't stand, it's very similar to, to Colin Kaepernick, where she felt personally she could no longer stand for the anthem given what she had experienced in her own life and what she was seeing. Um, and, and recognizing what's going on in this country. And this is 2003, so when patriotism is at an all-time high as a result of, two, of, of 9-11. So she decided that she would not stand for the national anthem, and it, was a, it, it created an, a, 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 a real firestorm around her where she was receiving threats and there was problems with her teammates, and it was a real issue for her. Um, and, and so I interviewed her and she tells her story, which was, is amazing. It's a story that I didn't even know about. And this was way back in 2003. She was, she was pretty inspirational, not only with her story, but, you know, several years, 20 years later, she's still doing that same, uh, same work almost 30 years later now. And, um, and she talks about this moment right now. And she talks about things like companies that are, you know, getting behind this movement, and she makes some very poignant comments about whether or not they're actually helping or whether they're co-opting it. And that was something as well that, you know, just, it was a very interesting and very informative conversation with her. Your submission to the Sports Podcast Awards came with some incredible um, feedback. If you go on to, to, to Audible and wherever you find it, you can see that what you've done is, is created um, and changed a lot of people's opinions. How important is it to get that kind of feedback for yourself? Yeah, it was great to, to hear the feedback, you know, um, the comments people left on Audible, um, you know, comments people made to me um, about these stories and how we told the stories and how, you know, they... You know, people told me they sat down to listen to one episode and thought, you know, I'll listen to this one, then I'll listen to another one tomorrow and, you know, and get through it over a week. And they sat and listened to the whole thing because they just couldn't stop, which was pretty amazing. And people, you know, who, who you know, they, what we set out to do was tell stories that people didn't know, but also tell the backstory to some of the stories that people knew but had only heard you know, sort of reported in the news and didn't understand the full story. And, and, and I think we accomplished that where people, you know, talk about, you know, the Colin Kaepernick story that they thought they knew, but then in listening to Nate Boyer tell them that, hey, you know, I'm a, I'm a white man, Green Beret, and I'm the one who told him to sit, <laughs> you know, and, um, and, and how he talks about how, you know, he wanted to tell that story. He wanted people to know that he's a white man who was a military in you know, the Green Beret, one of the highest honors you can have, you know, in this country and serving. No one wanted to listen to him. No media wanted to listen to him because it didn't fit the narrative that they wanted to tell about the Kaepernick story. So people hearing those sorts of things and listening to me talk to Nate Boyer and him tell that, you know, I think we, we, we accomplished what we, what we needed to in telling the stories that people didn't know. What's next for you and what's next for Defiance? Yeah, so you know, I'll, I'll keep uh, keep trying to to be defiant in my own way, and um, but also, um, yeah, you know, personally for me, I think um, you know what has happened over the last uh, few years with regard to the, you know, 
recognition of the inequality in the, in the world uh, has become very important to me. And, and I think that, uh, you know, uh, continuing to try to do what I can and use my platform. I was inspired listening to a lot of the people that I talked to, uh, athletes and, and, and studying up on athletes that I didn't even know their stories, like a Tony Smith Thompson. That was all uh, very inspirational to me. So I'll continue to use my platform in whatever best ways I can to, to try to bring about the change that I want to see. You truly have created something that is defiant, that is inspirational, that will change a lot of the beliefs. And we've obviously got a long way to go across the, across the world, but you are uh, our, our sports documentary winner and I wish you the best of luck in the future. Yeah, thank you. So congratulations to Folding Pocket. Well done to Michael and well done to Hask in his role as podcast uh, host and presenter. We are going to be back next week. We've actually got Ellis coming down to join us. I've been promised that there's going to be gin flowing as well. So the four of us will be back together to debrief on a remarkable Six Nations and to check in on how Leicester are faring as we head towards the end of the season with the Rhino Bambino next week. Until then, thank you once again to Shane. Lovely to have you with us. We have been The Good, The Bad and The Rugby. We'll see you in a week's time. The show is produced by Shara Kilgallen. The Good, The Bad and The Rugby is a Folding Pocket production. Enjoy the rest of your week.